joining us, Michael. Thank you, Wendy. I'm delighted to be here because, as you can hear, I've had a history in Portland. I love Portland. It is my second home. It's a place that I've been, you know, for many years been involved here. So uh, The Death and Life of Downtown Portland, that's an allusion to the great book of Jane Jacobs. Many of you know, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And I think where we are in Portland right now, clearly we've got a critical situation. I think everybody recognizes that. But I'm hoping that this talk I'll give tonight provides some optimism, some sense of the bigger picture here, the history of Portland as a city that has gone through other periods like this in the past and come out of them. And there are great resources here, fantastic resources really that I'm gonna talk about. And I'm gonna do it in the context of Jane Jacobs book. Again, I've spent a number of years here in Portland thinking about the challenges of the city. I not only travel around and talk to people about their challenges and what maybe specific recommendations can be made, but I also work in my day job, so to speak, on actually building these kinds of places, getting affordable housing built, getting walkable mixed-use communities built, and dealing with places that are struggling, as indeed Portland is right now, and many cities are. This is not just a Portland problem. And I'm going to talk about Jane Jacobs' great book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. And what she pointed out, she was talking about New York in that book. And New York went through some tough times and came out of them and has uh, had a renaissance. And the point that she made was that that happened as the result of choices that people made. The struggles happened as a result of choices, and the Renaissance happened as a result of choices. And that happens in cities all over the world and throughout history. Yes, there are historic forces, but there are also choices that we can make that can promote a Renaissance, a promote a great success after a period of struggle as we're experiencing now. Uh, my own history goes back to when I was an undergraduate at Evergreen uh, and coming through Portland in the 1970s, and then I've lived in the area, parts of the region for a number of years, and know the city very well. And back in the 1970s, you may remember, even going back to the 1960s, Portland was a struggling town. The problems that we have today were, in many ways, nothing compared to coming out of this post-industrial period, like a number of cities across the United States, the sort of hollowed out core, everybody going out to the suburbs. We're experiencing a little of that now, but it was epidemic at that time. And um, in fact, it looks like there was nothing but cars in the center of Portland. If you look at some of the photos, a very car dominated pattern. Uh, Robert Moses, who was Jane Jacobs's nemesis in New York, traveled around the country and promoted building freeways that cut through the middle of cities and cut them to pieces, really, encouraged people to get in their cars and drive through the cores and go out to the suburbs and so on. Uh, the red ones are the ones that were built, as you probably recognize. The green ones were the ones that were opposed by the citizens. In fact, that was an important moment in, of catalyzing citizen opposition to this way of doing things, this evisceration of cities, as Jacob referred to it, and embracing what we had here, what we still have, the remarkable heritage, the splendid walkable urban fabric, the world-class architects like A.E. Doyle, who did the Central Library and other great uh, buildings around the area, Wade Pipes, who studied in England and um, came back and did a very unique Northwest arts and crafts style here and other architects. And of course, the craftsman architecture that was really uh, affordable, relatively affordable at the time. And Gustav Stickley, who promoted the, the craftsman architecture, that was very much their goal, was to make a housing that was diverse and affordable for a lot of different people. And we have that heritage now uh, still to this day. And yes, we have very splendid homes as well uh, and uh, splendid neighborhoods and splendid commercial districts and so on. But coming out of World War II, there was a sense that, no, no, we've got to get modern. We've got to tear down the old Portland Hotel and promote auto mobility. That was the parking lot that is where Pioneer Square is now. And this was going on not only in the core, but all over the city, this wave of demolitions, epidemic of demolitions, and then replacement with this sort of regrettable mid-century buildings, I think. I know there's a fashion 
to embrace them. But I think that's a bit of nostalgia run amok because these were not buildings that were particularly friendly to pedestrians. They were made for cars. They were made to drive by fast and not particularly cozy with those blank panels and spandrels and so on. And again, auto dominated pattern that was happening all over the city and all over the region and destroying neighborhoods that were viable, what the writer James Baldwin referred to as Negro removal, a really disgraceful episode to be sure in our history and replacing them with these auto-dominated uh, places. So here we are in the 1980s and 1990s and thereabouts. Portland has become a poster child for good urban planning, right? The core is revived. We're having a renaissance. How did we get to that point? Well, I know many of you know this story. In 1970, there was increasing opposition to this over-auto-dominated way of eviscerating our city core. A lot of grassroots political activism. A new council was elected. Tom McCall came into office around that time and enacted Senate Bill 100 to create an urban growth boundary that essentially put a pricing signal towards the core that now we're gonna reinforce the core. We're not just gonna go outward forevermore. Um, and the Harbor Freeway was demolished. Pioneer Square property was uh, acquired. Metro was created. The first light rail opened. Uh, the 2040 growth concept was created, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little more detail. And I think we all recognize the city leadership and the activists recognize that the architectural heritage was critical and that we could build on it. We didn't have to contrast with it or turn our backs on it or indeed demolish it, that we could regenerate Old Town and Ankeny and we could build Pioneer Square in a respectful revival of some of the historic architecture that was very human oriented and human focused and very successful in doing so. And building on the streetcar patterns and the small walkable blocks, you know, Jane Jacobs came to Portland and talked about how lucky we were to have this urban fabric, these small walkable blocks. And if you will, the DNA of place, this sort of fine-grained, diverse, lively neighborhood structure that is really a wonderful asset and was then and still is. And learning from people like Jane Jacobs, who, as I said, came to Portland and advised Christopher Alexander, whose pattern language methodology was taken up by the University of Oregon, uh, and other postmodern reformers of that time who said, we've got to return to a human-centered kind of urban planning and architecture. And again, there was a regional aspect to this that was critical to regenerate the sprawling suburbs as well. And that's a work in progress, to be sure. Uh, but it was something that was very important as part of thinking about the whole region as a system, not just one part of it. And this was a report in 2009 about how to implement the 2040 plan. I was part of this report, Gil Kelly and a number of others who really looked carefully at how we were going to implement this plan regionally. And I want to come back to that a little later and give some specifics and drill down into some specific recommendations. And there was a sense that the political activism was much more united, I think, than it is today, that there were coalitions of people who were committed to civil rights and to racial equality and to preservation, historic preservation, and to foreign policy issues that were especially hitting hard the African-American community at that time, and so on. This was seen as all part of one systemic problem that we had to confront and we had to be united to do that. And that was a very important component, I think. And we paid attention to the basics, to clean, attractive, livable neighborhoods, to streetscapes that were clean and well-maintained and safe. And this was something that I think we recognized at the time, and perhaps we've lost sight of, I'll talk about that more later, um, that we must pay attention to the fundamentals if we're going to get anywhere on all the other issues. And Portland, of course, has been celebrated, rightly so, around the country and around the world that it's a city that has spearheaded uh, urban livability with growth boundaries, public transportation, citizen participation, and neighborhood associations at the forefront of a movement to create livable urban regions and so on. And much was achieved. We can take a lot of pride in that, and we shouldn't forget how much has been achieved. This is the Harbor Freeway on the left, and this is the Tom McCall Waterfront Park. 
And neighborhood associations were critical partners in that. And I think we all need to recognize that. This emphasis on livable heritage did not compromise economic development. As many naysayers said at the time, you guys are quixotic, you're just a bunch of hippies, and you, know, you want Portland to be all about neighborhoods and funky character and quality of life and so on, but we need to be with it and more economically you know, based on the new modern car culture and so on. On the contrary, this put Portland on the map as a desirable destination, its livable qualities, and it helped to spark similar movements in Seattle, Vancouver, Los Angeles, and elsewhere. Now, my former hometown of Austin has done the same thing. Austin is growing by leaps and bounds, and we can maybe talk about the difference between Austin and Portland, but certainly Austin embraced the Portland model of livability as a sort of economic driver of the city's prosperity. And yet, uh, many of us have been concerned for quite a while, not just in the last couple of years, that we've lost the plot. And say we, all of us together, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody individually here, that we've become too complacent. We've rested on our laurels. Maybe we've believed our own hype a bit too much. And we've fallen prey to simplistic silver bullet thinking, uh, regressing to the old failed modernist approaches uh, and single variable thinking and so on. And maybe part of it is we've let money and power corrupt our thinking, something that we've always have to be on guard against, I think. And uh, this idea that we can build our way out of our problems just by selecting one variable like housing supply, I think is very dangerous because it has not resulted in success. This is something that we've been talking about for a number of years now. There's uh, Wendy and our dear friend Suzanne Lenard on the lower right. Uh, and we're not the ones that are too tall in that picture. Uh, at any rate, we were concerned at the time and still concerned that this single variable thinking is not going to solve our problems. In fact, in many ways, it's made them worse. And this idea that we just need to demolish our way and build our way to new structures, new housing supply, and so on, and new this sort of formulaic, generic global architecture, if you will, that is not rooted in the local heritage, not rooted in place and human placemaking. And I say this from a critical position against my own profession of architecture. I have my PhD in architecture. I love architecture, but I think we have failed to embrace the collective intelligence of evolutionary history. We've fallen prey to star architecture, which is really a glitzy artistic packaging over a questionable global industrial product, a Western industrial product, an architecture of fashion, of novelty, and not an architecture of place and people. And ultimately, this is not sustainable. It is contributing to our problems, to our crisis, really. And I am by no means the only person saying this. Many leading architects, in fact, are talking about this crisis of the professions, uh, architecture and planning. Rem Koolhaas talks about the failure, the hoax, the magic that didn't work of modernism's alchemistic promise. Frank Gehry talks about 98% of what gets built and designed is pure SHIT. Peter Eisenman talks about the late period of modernism. We're stuck in it, this Rococo phase that we want to get out, but we can't figure out how to. Then Peter Buchanan, the architecture critic, calls for a big rethink, says that we need to recognize that the modernist and neo-modernist approach we're taking today is unsustainable to its core. Many, many people are talking about this. And Jane Jacobs, going back to 1961, and many other critics back then were talking about this, talking about the pseudoscience of planning and architecture that seems almost neurotic in its determination to imitate empiric failure and ignore empiric success, failing to learn from the regrettable mistakes of the past. In fact, doubling down on some of those mistakes and not to pick on the modernist architects too much, uh, the hack traditional is also very destructive and very lamentable in many parts of the region, no question about it. But the point is that the architectural leadership is missing, the leadership of the culture of building, if you will, that people like Gustav Stickley and Frank Lloyd Wright and others were calling on the profession to, to do. And the idea that grassroots democracy is essential, is an essential ingredient 
in dealing with our problems, in harnessing that energy and that collaborative problem solving. This is something that the city of Portland's website crows about even now. And yet this is what many of you know, the policy director for the former commissioner who was responsible for the neighborhood association system, uh, not popular among the neighborhood associations, I would think is a fair statement, is voicing, I think, an opinion of a lot of people, unfortunately, that we need to put neighborhood associations in their place. They are too powerful. They're the enemy. We need to fight them. We need to oppose them. We need to be in battle, essentially, against these people and shove down their throats what they don't like, because that's going to solve our problems. I think, friends, that this is part of a larger mentality that's going on all across the country, the divisiveness that we see all across the country and all across the globe that is pitting people against each other, failing to unite us in order to solve our problems as we must do if we're going to get anywhere. And it's certainly making the tech companies a lot of money. Maybe that's the ultimate goal behind all of this. But at any rate, there are more collaborative platforms out there. There are ways to work collaboratively and more intelligently together. Wikipedia, to take a trivial example of something on the web that actually comes out of Christopher Alexander's pattern technology, as a matter of fact, and Open Plans, which is a New York City-based collaborative platform for solving urban issues and so on. So there are ways to do this. There are ways to come together and to collaborate, to create a collaborative civic commons, if you will. And another point is that when we make the rules of the game certain ways, we can encourage collaboration or we can encourage divisiveness and fighting. We need to recognize that. And I'll give you an example, a kind of funny example of a parent bringing a couple of slices of cake to the kids. And what are they going to do? The kids are very likely going to fight over the slices of cake, right? Well, what if the parent comes along and says, actually, you, child number one, are going to cut the cake and you, child number two, are going to pick the first slice? What you're going to see is that child number one is going to cut that slice unbelievably carefully, right, in a way that is the fairest possible division of that slice. So the rules of the game are rewarding cooperation. That's a very important idea, I think, in terms of how we think about how we structure our institutions and our collaborative mechanisms in a place like Portland. By the way, this is uh, DALI2, the AI software, and that's another scary topic when it comes to technology and social media, but that's another talk for another day, perhaps. But there are other platforms that we can use and should use, I think, that are not only here in Portland, but nationally and internationally, UN Habitat and the Habitat 3 conference that Wendy mentioned, where people are coming together and sharing their lessons city to city, peer to peer, uh, the international making cities livable that our dear friend Suzanne Lennard started, that we're running it again this year, we're doing it with Prince Charles, who's now the King's Princess Foundation, many other parts of the world that we can learn from and we can share lessons about what is working, what is not working, learning from our successes as well as our mistakes and learning from our own history and from thoughtful scholars like Jane Jacobs. Jacobs in Death and Life makes some very important points. One of them is we have to understand if we're going to get anywhere the kind of problem we're dealing with when we deal with cities. If we don't understand that, we're going to continue making the same mistakes and we're going to see the same problems, which I think is what we're seeing. And she talked about how science coming into the early 20th century had mastered two variable problems really well, like the relationship between a gas pressure and a gas volume, that kind of problem. Then we began to understand statistical problems really well, problems of average populations. But we left over, we skipped over, she said, a kind of great middle region, the problem that she referred to as problems of organized complexity, where it's not just the number of variables and it's not just two variables, it's a kind of web network of variables or a situation in which they're interrelated into an organic whole, as she put it. And these are the kinds of problems that are especially important for cities. So if we don't understand that, and we think that, for example, if we don't have enough housing affordability, then the way to deal with that is housing supply, a two variable 
problem. It's housing demand, housing supply, right? Well, Vancouver tried that and built a whole lot of housing and it did not reduce housing costs. In fact, it's if anything, Vancouver is still one of the most expensive cities in the world. If we think about uh, traffic problems, for example, as statistical problems, and well, we just need to widen the streets and we need to allow more movement across the system. Well, that doesn't work either because it doesn't account for induced demand and the fact that people have choices and there's a, a interactive effects, dynamical effects. And we need to understand that this is the kind of problem that's especially important in cities. The problems that exist at the neighborhood scale when different elements are interrelated with one another, like over here by Powell's, where you've got the streetcar and this crossing light and the bookstore and all these elements acting together as part of a system. We have to understand that, that this is the nature of our problems, that they're related in this way. And they present situations in which a half dozen or several dozen quantities are all varying simultaneously. And there's not just one two variable relationship that explains it or even one problem in organized complexity, which explains all. And as long as we don't understand that city planners, business people, lenders, legislators uh, cling to these unexamined assumptions, then we found the shortest distance to a dead end. And I think, frankly, that is very much the case in many cities around the world today, not just Portland. There are other great insights from that book, many of you know, and I highly recommend the book if you haven't read it or reread it. I teach a course on it, and it's amazing how relevant it is. She talked about the importance of diversity and generators of diversity, like the mix of uses, small blocks, walkable blocks, diversity of building age and uses, concentration of people and activities, and so on. And the lowly sidewalk, the public realm, which is where we mix with other people unlike ourselves, and that's so critical. And we form connections that we wouldn't otherwise form. This is what the sociologists call weak ties. You know, you're walking down the street with a friend and they say, oh, here's somebody else. Uh, you, you guys should meet. This person is starting a new business or whatever. Uh, that's the propinquity and serendipity, the closeness and the accidental encounter that turns out to be really important for generating creativity and economic activity at knowledge spillovers, economic spillovers. And there's a lot of research on that now that this is very, very very important. Then it's a great asset that Portland has, that downtown Portland has, and you should keep that in mind when you start thinking about decamping to the suburbs. That is not going to be, uh, unless the suburbs have similar kinds of public spaces. A number of people prominent economists and others have been influenced by Jacobs, people like Edward Glazer, Richard Florida, many of you have heard of talking about the creative class. However, we have to bear in mind that if a little is good, it doesn't always follow that a lot is better. If two aspirins are twice as good as one aspirin, does it follow that 100 aspirin are 100 times as good as one aspirin? Clearly not, right? There are issues of scale things that don't necessarily scale up. And to their credit, both Florida and Glazer have recognized that they've maybe failed to account for the dark side of this you know, urban creative approach, this idea of only creating agglomeration benefits and making the cores white hot and dealing with the top of the pyramid, so to speak, uh, and leaving everybody else behind thinking that it'll trickle down. You know, this is similar to the idea of trickle down economics or supply side economics that George Bush famously criticized in the 1980s. You may remember that if you focus on the top of the pyramid, it will trickle down to everybody else. And clearly, we don't have uh, a lot of people included in that mix. We have record income inequality, record numbers of people who have been left behind, not only in the urban region, but nationally, the left behind regions who are very resentful of the urban cores and a lot of resentment and anger that is manifesting in populist uh, politics and other 
forms that are destructive. So the idea that we should focus on the core, including downtown Portland, and jam new buildings in it, I think is an example of this top of the pyramid thinking that we just need to create this sort of white hot nuclear reaction in the core. Uh, we need to build tall buildings and bring in wealthy people and have you know the top of the pyramid doing all this wonderful economic activity, the urban elites and so on, and it's all gonna trickle down to everybody else without taking care of everybody else, taking care of people who are low income and homeless and all the rest of it. You can't do that and expect it to work. You can't approach it with a silver bullet approach of that kind. Um, we know from some of the research in, for example, network theory, that it's not just the core of the network, the rich club networks, as they call them, or the small world networks, but the entire network that generates benefits. There's something called Metcalfe's Law, which says that your network gets stronger when you have more people plugged into it because everybody's contributing. And when you exclude people, they not only require social services and maybe there's more crime and there's more policing and all the rest of it, but you've lost their creative input to the economy of the region, to the what you can become as a region when you take that kind of approach. So we need to think polycentrically, not only about the core, but also about the solutions to our problems and how we can be more joined up in our thinking. But speaking about the region and the core, I want to talk a little bit more about this idea that it's not just a single variable like housing supply, but it's a balance of factors. Um, and this is true with the question of gentrification and something I like to call the Jacobs curve. You know, Jacobs talked about the need for diversity, the need for people not only to not have wealthy cores and gentrification, right, but also not to live in low income areas or slums. People don't want to live in exclusively low income areas and not have opportunities. They want to be somewhere in between, right? They want to be in this optimum zone of high diversity and a mix of low income and high income. And we as policymakers and practitioners need to make sure that that is where we should be. We need tools. We need economic strategies to promote opportunities for everybody, not just the top of the pyramid. And we need to protect against displacement. We also need to use tools to avoid tipping over into what Jacobs called the self-destruction of diversity. In fact, we need to make sure that we can arrest that tipping over into gentrification, uh, which we unfortunately have not done a good job of in this region, I don't think. Um, and what kinds of tools am I talking about? Well, many of you know, tax policies, targeted funding, catalytic projects, uh, amenities, land trust, uh, guaranteed rents, and a well-connected public realm that gives everybody an opportunity that is safe and clean and not just left to you know people who are homeless or people who are one income category or another. It's a place for everyone to share the public realm, shared amenities and gathering places and targeted strategic interventions. And I want to go back to this report from 2009, because again, this was what, 14 years ago now, that there have been a number of proposals on the table that have been discussing these kinds of approaches that I really think we should take more seriously now, especially in the wake of our current problems, recognizing there is a lot of opportunities for infill, but we need to unlock that infill with careful catalytic tools. We need to recognize the importance of public buy-in. We are in a democracy. We need to recognize that people have a right to participate in the public process and we need to make them allies, not enemies. Uh, we need to recognize that we need sustained collaboration between different sectors. We need institutional platforms to do that. Uh, we need to overcome uh, the present obstacles and create new mechanisms uh, to further this development and to unlock these sites. And I'm gonna come back to that point in, in a little more detail later to recognize we still have many barriers to good quality walkable mixed use for everybody around the region. And we need to recognize the need for toolkits that we need to assemble. I would think of it as plug and play toolkits that make it possible, design prototypes, pre-approved designs perhaps that are already bought into by the neighborhood, pre-reviewed by the city and so on, design standards that are already approved. I'll talk about that in a little, in a little more detail.
what we can recognize is, yes, we've got to overcome nimbyism, not in my backyard, no growth. But we also can't just expect people to say, Yimby, yes, in my backyard, build baby, build whatever you want. Because people do have a concern about whether what is being built is going to degrade their quality of life, their livability, and so on. And they have the right to do that in a democracy. They are citizens, after all. They are the people whose homes and neighborhoods are going to be affected by this. So I think we need to recognize that part of this Quimby approach, you might say, is using an evidence-based approach following A.E. Doyle's idea that we're going to preserve the beauty of the city and add to it. We're not going to detract from the city in the name of some theoretical goal of housing units or whatever. We're going to build them on the public realm, our urban commons. We're going to not demonize one another and throw different groups under the bus. We're going to build collaboration, trust, and multilateral solutions at the outset. Remember the game theory thing and the cutting the cake and all of that. Uh, the best benchmark of sustainability is what has already sustained. And we need to believe in the public process. If we are true Democrats, small d, I hope we are, this is another blog post that I've published nationally, and I've been invited to speak on this internationally. I think people around the country and around the world are hungry for something like this. The idea that we need to recognize that we have to rethink gentrification and affordability, and this quality in my backyard may offer a path. Uh, again, following Jane Jacobs' insight that if we don't understand the kind of problem we're dealing with, we've got the shortest distance to a dead end. And unfortunately, that still rings true uh, after 60 years. We need to be careful not to try to solve for a two-variable problem, whatever that may be. Yes, we do need more housing supply, but it matters what we build and where we build, right? We can't just build skyscrapers for the wealthy and expect that to work for everybody. There may be a little bit of the filtering effect, but that is a small percentage, and it's clearly not working in places like Vancouver. Um, maybe we need to start by giving our fellow citizens their democratic due, including neighborhood associations. We cannot simply attribute simplistic and malevolent motives. Racism may well be a factor, often is a factor, unfortunately, but so are other factors, including the idea that maybe I'm going to lose my quality of life, whatever that is. And we don't do ourselves any favors by simply focusing on the human failings of other people that we need as collaborators if we're going to get anywhere. I think we've gotten to a point where this is painfully evident. And we need to respect the aesthetic evaluations of existing residents. There's a lot of research on this that lay people, so to speak, have different aesthetic evaluations than professionals like me and like architects and planners. And we're building for them, not for ourselves. You know, we have a duty of care, I think, to make sure that they are comfortable and find it livable, find it desirable, find it to be a place that they want to be in because it's their homes and they're in a, in a democracy. And we need to recognize that it is not really the players, it's the game that we have to restructure here. We need to restructure the public involvement process. And I think, frankly, the neighborhood association system needs to be restructured in Portland, a bigger topic perhaps than this conversation. I mentioned economic tools, taxation tools, fees, fee baits, incentive, disincentives, ways to unlock many more sites, including the corridors, wasteful landscape setbacks, underutilized parking lots, dying malls, and all the other places. There there are lots and lots of sites around Portland that we can unlock in a polycentric way, not just in the core, and we can convert people to become Quimby's. You all probably saw this report recently that just came out. Um, I agree with a lot of it that we need to think about how to repurpose a lot of this office that is not going to be coming back anytime soon, bring in more housing, more culture, more entertainment, more education, more destinations downtown. The only thing I would add to that is we've got to do that in the broader context of the region and think polycentrically, as I've been saying. So in closing, a couple of key points here. One is COVID-19 has clearly 
caused major devastation, not only for Portland, but for cities around the globe. And there's no question about that for what it's done to businesses, to office space and many others, retail and so on. And the 2020 protests have been devastating and the political divisions that have been part of that. But I think a key point we should understand and build upon is the idea that the structural problems predate these events. They were already happening and these events were catalysts for what has happened as a result. And the structural solutions are there too, if we will look more carefully for them. A couple of concrete recommendations I'm gonna make here. Understand what we have to work with from history, what we have in our small blocks, our urban fabric and so on. Understand what we have to work with in each other, not only each other here in Portland, but nationally and internationally. Tend to the fundamentals, clean, safe streets and public spaces. That's got to be a priority before we do anything else. Tend to the fundamentals of human services. I think we need an Apollo program to address homelessness and to address affordability housing, giving people addresses, giving them jobs. Perhaps they can become people who tend to the public realm and improve it. Assess and learn from past mistakes, including this idea of voodoo urbanism, as I referred to it. Stop demonizing and get to work with everyone, not just a selected few. Don't demonize a select few and don't tokenize a select few that you think are going to now be representative of some group that you think has been excluded. You've still got the thumb on the scales. That is not a democratic approach. You need to be meaningfully inclusive and develop a new collaborative platform building on the 2009 Metro report, as I discussed, this idea of Quimby and plug and play, urbanism and so on, other good work that's been ignored for too long, Uh, learning from these simplistic and failed approaches that have gotten us to where we are, build an evolving toolkit of proven solutions. And I do think the evidence is very encouraging. I hope I leave you with an inspiring and hopeful point, which is that a renaissance is possible as history shows, but it's going to require us to learn from history and from the evidence. And on that note, I'll close from this quote that's attributed to Mark Twain. It actually isn't Mark Twain, I don't think, but it's a good one anyway. History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Oh, gosh, thank you so much. Um, So there are actually, um, we're asking people to put their questions in uh, the uh, chat. And there are an awful lot of of comments, which I don't think we have time for. But there was, there have been a couple very good questions, I thought. Uh, Michael, if I can find it now. So uh, Kun Wu Dodd said, um, why doesn't building more housing, in other words, vertical housing, uh, help with the housing problem per the Vancouver example? And I think you can probably explain that further. Yeah, so real estate is not a um, simple two variable problem, right? Anybody who knows real estate knows that the old, the old saying, the three most important factors of real estate, location, 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 right? So it matters where you build, it matters how that context exists, it matters what kinds of tools you use to allow different people to access that. If it's only the wealthy and only say, people who are using the uh, the condos uh, as safe deposit boxes in the sky and maybe occupying them three months of the year or something, then you're not going to get the effect of the supply that you want. So I'm not saying that supply isn't important, it is, but it's one variable among many. And again, you can't single out a single variable. That's where we get into trouble when we do that. So I see another question from N. Chapin, uh, who says, at what point do developers, planners, and cities acknowledge that spread out cities with 75% of adults that still use vehicles to work and shop and public transportation that isn't everywhere need to allow for places to park those vehicles? i.e. there are 140 apartments and 21 parking spaces fronting on Southeast Division and 84th. Uh, And the downtown is, I I would add, is uh, down to small businesses are suffering from the lack of street parking as well. So 
I think so, that's a decent. I think this is an important point that, first of all, you've got to be pragmatic. You've got to recognize where people are today. And then you don't say, oh, well, would they, they are all using cars. We have to use cars forever. Jane Jacob talked about the attrition of automobiles. You have to think incrementally. How are we going to start where we are today, not just go to pie in the sky on day one, and then get to where we want to be ultimately? So, for example, um, I, you mentioned that I worked on the Orenco Station project, and we knew starting out that most people were going to be in their cars. But we also knew that over time, they would have opportunities to walk and to bike and to take the light rail. And that's exactly what happened. And the number of car owners or the number of cars that people owned went down. The vehicle miles traveled went down. That's an example of that incremental change. And Arenco Station has some pretty uh, impressive statistics now, the metrics in relative to the baseline of that area of the suburbs, right? So it is possible to make dramatic improvements, but you've got to do it over time. You've got to be pragmatic. And for example, perhaps building a, a parking garage where you have the, um, the floors that are flat rather than the ramped floors. And then that parking garage, if and when people do, um, if, if they are either, you know, getting rid of their cars and walking more, living downtown, perhaps you don't need the, the um, uh, more residents downtown, you don't need the parking, then you can convert those spaces to other uses. Again, thinking incrementally, thinking about how you transition over time to a more, um, ultimately more sustainable future, uh, which is where we've got to get to. Uh, we can't, I mean, that, I think one thing we, I hope we can all recognize is that the kind of urban world we've created, the kind of uh, world with um, the uh, resource consumption and depletion and habitat destruction and, and uh, pollution and contamination and greenhouse gas emissions is not sustainable. We do have to change. We will change, actually. I'll put it differently. The only question is, will we change on our own terms or on terms that are forced upon us in a very disagreeable way? And I think this is really the question that Portland can face and can be a leader, has been a leader and can be again but we've got to be more pragmatic. Um, so Xavier Stickler has a question um, that uh, is an interesting one. Um, nearly all planners and architects I've spoken to feel uh, strongly about creating more walkable, livable communities, but feel developers share no such similar leanings. Do you agree that developers and capital interests are a major block? And if so, how do we move past that? I think that's part of it, yes. I mean, I think, again, if you go back to the game theory idea that the developers, and I've sat on that side of the table, I was a um, development executive uh, for PAC Trust when we did the Orinco Station project. And I know what the world looks like when you're about to lose your shirt if you don't sell the units and build, you know. So um, we can understand, I think, and sympathize with the developers who are saying, look, don't make me do this and that. And the other thing, I'm barely going to make a living as it is. And what we need to do then is make sure that they have a, a certain basic level of comfort with the um, development model that you're proposing, whether it's public space, uh, streetscape, uh, density levels, whatever it may be. And I think this was a lesson we learned with the Rinko Station, I think, and I wish it was a lesson that was more widely received in the region, that you've got to be market facing. You've got to make sure that the developers have the incentives and the risk mitigation, whether it's financial incentives or um, um, you know, the ability to, to uh, and, and in the case of Orenco Station, what we were able to do with the city of Hillsborough is get some flexibility from the city to say, okay, you know what the policy goals are, and with Metro and with TriMet, our other uh, partners in that project, you know what the policy goals are, uh, but we know what the market will allow us to do. So give us the flexibility to meet the market and achieve the policy goals, and we'll collaborate together on that. And I think that was an important uh, model, an important lesson in many ways, to get developers on your side, because at the end of the day, they want to be proud of their work. You know, they want to feel that they're uh, doing something that contributes to, you know, making a better future 
for for all of us. But if you if you make it an adversarial relationship and you say, well, you got to do this, that, and the other, and uh, I call it field of dreams planning, right? Plan it, and they will come. No, you've got to be market facing. You've got to understand how the developers are going to have to make it work. Um, and um, and yes, global capital is a very destructive force right now when it comes to real estate economics because it does not have the incentives and disincentives channelized into the kind of development that we actually want. Jane Jacobs had a line in Death and Life that I think is really important and it's just stuck in there somewhere. It says, we've created city marvels, uh, we humans, and, and yet we left out feedback. What is, what is it that we need to do to make up for this omission? Feedback, economic feedback externality feedback, making good development pay, pay its own way and making bad development maybe pay its own externality costs. If those are costs that are gonna be passed on to the taxpayer, figure out how to rebalance that equation with good economic tools. I think that's the challenge. That is really good. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Heather Flint Chateau has a question mm -hmm. I think uh, worth posing. People describe Portland as a city of neighborhoods. Polycentric approaches are key, and recent policy has not necessarily been tuned to context. Can you speak about one human scale design and two Portland's center and corridors approach that has been foundational? You did a great talk on what was done early, but the pieces that are still missing, which were part of the original intent to make it work, uh, Heather Forage design plus planning. Well, I want to call out Heather for some great work she's done and Lawrence, my friend Lawrence Kamar, uh, my partner in crime on some of our uh, day job work um, and, and the work they did in Woodstock and other work that Heather has done to try to take the, on this Quimby approach, as I call it, to get the community behind certain sort of ready to go plug and play models that will allow things to get built out. And it, I think Woodstock is an interesting and encouraging example of that. Um, and so I applaud Heather and others who have been working on this. You know, this, this Quimby model or whatever you wanna call it, it goes by a number of different names. It's happening in a number of cities uh, around the country and around the world. And um, I, I mentioned that article, maybe we can provide links to some of these articles it's if you want to follow up. But I think this is um, uh, something that Portland could be a real leader on in you know, saying, hey, we recognize our challenges, here's what we need to do. And, and uh, you know, taking some of the work that Heather and, and Lawrence and others have done. Okay, um, I think, I think we are wrapping up, Michael. That was absolutely fabulous and really informative and um, can't really can't thank you enough. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to do it and I'm, I, I recorded this and I'll, we'll put it on Zoom, uh, I mean on uh, YouTube. And, yeah, and I'll, I can I'll try to <laughs> include the chat. The, I'll, I'll copy the chat text as well and we can put that on there as well. So I think, you know, I hope, I hope we see this as a beginning of a, or not a beginning, but maybe a, a step in a larger conversation that we can have. Uh, and I, I, as somebody who is, a, I consider myself still a stakeholder in uh, Portland's future as a, uh, uh, you know, somebody who knows and loves Portland and would love to see, see, uh, see things uh, going great guns again. I would just we put sure a plug out there, Michael, if you can share your um, share your talk on centers and corridors, maybe when you send out the link from this recording, it's, sure. a, it's an excellent follow up, I think, for um, early planning that has some pieces we could pick up on now. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Michael. Nicely done. Uh, it's true that Wendy and I will be in touch with you. So if anyone has additional questions that they think about later, uh, be in touch with Wendy or me, and we'll be directly in touch with uh, Michael with those additional questions and thoughts. We need to all raise our hands and compliment Michael for a very an informative set of thoughts for us to all consider in our dealings with our city and our community.